Okay, good evening, everyone. If you will make sure that you're uh, on mute so we don't hear your family conversations and turn your video off, that would be great. And I'm Ann Bryce with, uh, with Yolo Audubon. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I just have a couple of things to say. I want to remind everyone that uh, our next meeting is December 9th. And it's going to be the ID meeting for the Christmas bird count. And it's uh, typically our most popular meeting of the year. And it's not because everyone goes on the bird count. In fact, I'm gonna tell you more about that in just a second, but uh, it's because Steve Hampton runs it and it's a bird ID meeting and it's fun. And he has always has a lot of interesting information about trends with birds and what's happening. And I know he's gonna mention some about the fire because our count circle is, was uh, basically engulfed by the fire. Uh, so I invite you to come to that uh, December 9th at nine and it's a, a, not at nine, at seven and it's a Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah, I'll really confuse everyone. Uh, and then the actual Christmas bird count is December 20th. And we're not really recruiting people for that this year. We've, we've got our count leaders and a, a few people who, who've gone for uh, many years, but because of COVID and uh, it's so complicated, we in, invite you to come to the compilation at seven o'clock on the night of the 20th and see what was seen and join in that fun because it always is a, a, a fun, uh, meet, normally a dinner, but it will be Zoom this year. Uh, but unless you have a burning desire to be part of the Christmas bird count, uh, I'd say watch it on Zoom. And if you do have a burning desire, get in touch with Steve Hampton and all that is on our website. Um, I wanted to let you know that if you, we love to hear about sightings and we don't have time uh, doing this virtually for people to raise their hands and talk about their sightings. If you will put it in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen here in the middle, you'll see chat. Let us know what you've seen. And then Zane, who's our tech guy, uh, will uh, call him out at the end of the meeting and let us know what, what's been seen in, in the area. Also, if you have any questions, if you would please put that in the chat feature and then we will read those out to our speaker uh, when she's finished her presentation. So I think that's all I need to tell you. And now I'm going to introduce you to Ken Ely, who's our vice president in charge of our programs and he will in turn introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Uh, thanks everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, it's a special night. I put on a clean sweatshirt and a dress t-shirt. Um, I'm really excited about this. Uh, our, our program tonight is uh, about the great tail grackles. And I thought that was a, a, a great sighting when I saw my first one down at the Salton Sea in 1974. Um, and uh, we'll get, hope to learn a bit more. And then it was uh, interesting to see them up here in Yolo County. And so it's, we're gonna find out tonight kind of what makes them tick. And uh, we have um, our speaker, animal behaviorist, uh, Dr. Kelsey McCune, uh, PhD will, uh, she'll present some insights, uh, what they've learned so far, uh, what has been learned so far by the uh, Grackle Retail, uh, Grackle Retail, Grackle Project Research Group uh, about this uh, bird that originally hails from Central America. Now, I did not know that. Uh, and I thought, well, they've been around here for a long time. They must be native. So it's that's going to be very interesting to uh, find out about these guys. And like Zan said, uh, write your questions down uh, using the chat feature, and we'll get those to Kelsey at the end. So without further ado, I want to uh, bring on uh, Kelsey, Dr. Kelsey McCune, who's going to enlighten us um, about the uh, great world of the great tail grackle. So, right. I love this technology stuff. <laughs> and you're still front, so there we go. All right. Well, thanks, Ken, and thanks, Anne, and the rest of the Yolo Audubon Society for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen.
Okay, let's rearrange some of these things so that they're not in the way. Okay, so I'm really excited to be here with you guys to talk to you about a rapidly expanding species, the great-tailed grackle. Um, I think you guys will be particularly interested in this here in Northern California as this is sort of an emerging species for you. And I'll tell you more about that as we get through the talk. Um, so my name is Kelsey McCune and I'm a postdoctoral researcher. Um, and basically that means that I've completed my PhD and I'm doing additional research to gain new skills and expertise. My supervisor, some of you guys might know her, might have met her in person and heard about her project, the Grackle Project. Um, her name is Dr. Krina Logan, and she's affiliated with the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany. And this institute, I wanna give a big shout out to them because they are very generously funding the entire Grackle Project. So wanna make sure they get recognition. The other members of our lab currently are Dr. Alexis Free. Dr. Alexis Breen and Krista Rolls and Zara Marfori. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. Let's see here. Okay, so as you all probably know, humans are rapidly altering the natural environment and species vary in their ability to invade into and persist in these new and novel habitats. So imagine that you are a species, maybe since we're in California, California tohi, and you have evolved in an environment that looks like this. A lot of forests, a lot of green, little habitat fragmentation. So all of the traits that you have, you evolved to make you specifically suited to an environment that looks like this. As the environment begins to change to look like this, or as your range expands and you start to move into new areas that look like this, those traits are either going to help you persist in this novel environment or you're going to fail and die because your traits are not evolved to benefit you in these human modified environments. But we really don't specifically know which traits allow some species to expand into novel environments while other species fail. So on the Grackle project, we think the, that one important trait might be behavioral flexibility. So what is behavioral flexibility? Well, we like to think of it with this metaphor where someone who is not behaviorally flexible only basically has one tool in their toolbox. So to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So even though they are maybe trying to get this screw to go into this piece of wood, the only tool that they have to do this is a hammer, but the more appropriate tool would be a screwdriver. And so because they are using an inappropriate tool, the outcome is pretty bad where they're gonna bend the screw. Similarly, if they're trying to make cookies, the appropriate tool for this job is a mixer, but all they have is a hammer. And so their cookie dough is gonna be pretty weirdly mixed. Now you could crack a nut with a hammer, but the meat of the nut, the good part is gonna be shattered everywhere. So really the appropriate tool is going to be the nutcracker and Similarly, if you're trying to dig a hole, a shovel is really the appropriate thing to use. But to somebody who's not behaviorally flexible, they're not able to change to use the appropriate tool. So we define behavioral flexibility as the ability to change behavior when circumstances change based on learning from previous experience. So I want you guys to remember this definition and I will remind you of it later down the road because we're gonna bring it up a few times. And we wanna know whether behavioral flexibility is important in the ability of a species to expand its range into new habitat. And we're assuming that individuals need to rely on behavioral flexibility to rapidly adapt their behavior to fit with the current and novel situations in new environments. So to address these questions, we study the great-tailed grackle, which is a really ideal model system and that's because the great-tailed grackle has rapidly expanded their geographic range in the past 140 years. So for those of you that aren't familiar with this map, this is an eBird map. So eBird takes the number of observations of a species like a grackle, and then the more observations of a species in a given area, the darker purple the, they shade um, the area with. So grackles, great-tailed grackles are originally 
endemic to Central America. But they have pushed their way north through some of the deserts in Mexico, desert in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and they are now seen as far north as um, Canada, but only rarely in Canada. Um, so the other great thing about this species is that while other species that have expanded their range, like the European starling, that expansion is complete. So they've expanded the range across the entire US and there is no longer an expanding edge to the range. But we do have that with the great-tailed grackle. And in fact, it is here in California, one of the locations. So because there is an expanding edge, we're actually able to go and look at individuals in those populations on the edge and see how they might be different from individuals that are in the core areas of the range. So here in the core areas of the range, there have been many, many generations of grackles and they're not really experiencing novel environments that their ancestors did not experience. But that is the case for the ones on the expanding edge of the range. So to give you an idea of how quickly this has occurred, um, from the beginning of the 20th century till about the year 2000, grackles expanded their range into the US over by over 5,000%. So I mean that the size of their range has increased by over 5,000% in that very short time period. So that is very quick and um, kind of shocking. And we don't know all of the reasons how they're able to do this, but a good bet is that grackles are really good at taking advantage of uh, human changes to the environment. Specifically, as you see here in these two pictures, they're really good at eating our trash. Okay, so our, our two main goals for the grackle project are to, to address whether this rapidly expanding species is actually behaviorally flexible. And then we wanna know whether behavioral flexibility is promoted or constrained by some individual traits like cognitive abilities, personality traits, and physiology, and how variation in behavioral flexibility relates to the proximity to the range edge for that population. So in this way, we can kind of get an idea of whether behavioral flexibility has facilitated the expansion of these birds into novel habitats. So to begin to study these questions, we first have to catch the birds. Um, so I joined the project in Arizona and the two main methods that we use to catch the birds there are this picture here up top is a bow net trap. So we have food here at the back of the track this is a female grackle, they're brown and slightly smaller than the male grackles, which are black. And this um, moving arm of the trap is covered in foam. And when you hit the trigger, the arm moves over the grackle. There's a net in between it and the piece below it, so the grackle is caught. The other method that we use commonly in Arizona to catch grackles was the mist net, which some of you might be more familiar with. Um, a mist net is like a very large volleyball net that has uh, really fine thread. So actually in this picture here on the right, there's a mist net extended across the entire extent of this picture, but you can't see it. And that's really the point. So you set up the mist net in an area where the grackles are fr frequently flying through and the grackle doesn't see it. They fly into it um, and then they get tangled. And we have special training on how to safely extract these birds from the mist net. So after we catch the birds, we do a couple different things. And the first is that we give them these unique color combination of leg bracelets or leg bands. And that's so when we let them go again in the wild, we can tell them apart from each other. We also take a bunch of different kinds of body measurements. So bill length, leg length, things like that. And then we take a blood sample. Um, and we use the blood sample to measure certain physiological traits, which I'll tell you about later. Then a subset of the grackles that we catch, we keep temporarily in aviaries to measure the cognitive and personality traits that I'm going to tell you about. And the rest of the grackles, we let go at the location where we caught them. We will go find them again to measure some of their natural foraging, social, and space use behaviors. 
And I'll tell you briefly about those later too. Okay, so the birds that we keep for a short amount of time, we keep them in aviaries. Um, and I just wanted to show this here because um, this is our Arizona study site. And these are the aviaries that were on a roof of one of the science buildings there. And this is actually a Google Maps photo, a, a Google image photo. So we thought it was funny that our aviaries are sort of immortalized there in Arizona. And the other fun thing is that we literally just finished building the, the aviaries where we're going to keep grackles here in California. So this is a picture of me and Krista and Zara, and we're super excited to have that done so we can get started with data collection. Okay, so the big thing that we're interested in is behavioral flexibility. So I'm gonna tell you about how we do that first. So how is it that you can measure behavioral flexibility? We use a common uh, method for this trait called reversal learning. So there's two components to reversal learning. The first is that you get birds to learn that food is always in one specific color of container. So with the Grackle project, we use what we call reversal learning tubes. It's these, this dark gray and light gray tube. And so we first give the birds a bunch of trials until they have learned that the, say for example, the dark gray tube is always gonna have that cracker piece. Um, once they have learned this, then we switch which tube the food is in. So now, for example, the food is in the light gray tube and we measure how long it takes for the grackle to change its behavior now that the circumstance has changed and start going to the light gray tube. So this is our measure of behavioral flexibility, the ability to change behavior once the circumstances have changed. So here I'm gonna show you a video of what a uh, reversal learning trial looks like. So we bring the tubes in each trial and we always cover the holes with our hands so the birds can't cheat and see which tube contains the food. The birds can come down and they're only allowed to look into one of the tubes. So in this case, Adobo, which is the bird that we're seeing here, he chooses the correct tube. This tube has the food in it and he's able to eat the cracker. But if he had gone down to the light gray tube and looked in, then we take the tubes away and he doesn't get to eat the cracker. Um, and then we'll start the next trial and he gets another chance. So we do this until the bird has shown that it has learned to associate the color of the tube with a food. And by that, I mean that they choose the correct tube in at least 17 out of 20 trials in a row. After that happens, then we switch which tube the food goes into. And again, we measure how long it takes, how many trials before they learn the new tube color. And that's our measure of behavioral flexibility. Okay, so I just wanna show you some preliminary data. Um, this is actually uh, data that Karina collected in Santa Barbara when she was testing out these methods. Um, but importantly, we wanted to know whether grackles were behaviorally flexible. That was one of our key components that we wanted to know in this project. And so that's what we're, we're looking at here is the data from um, Santa Barbara, the initial population testing out these methods. So here in this column, on the left, we have learning speed, and that's the number of trials for the bird to initially, initially associate the color of the tube with a food reward. So actually, these birds are taking relatively few trials to initially learn this association. And here on the right, we have this column, which is the reversal speed, and that's the number of trials it took for the bird to switch to going to the uh, newly rewarded tube. So this is after we've reversed where the food is, and this is our measure of behavioral flexibility. The number of trials it took for the individual to change its behavior now that the circumstances have changed. So you can see that the number of trials for individuals to reverse their preference is consistently higher than the number of trials it took for them to initially learn to associate one color with food. But what does that mean for behavioral flexibility? Just looking at these numbers, it's hard to know whether um, a number of trials to reverse of 80 is a behaviorally flexible bird or a not behaviorally flexible bird. So we need to be able to compare this with something, maybe with some other species. 
And luckily, this method has been used in several other species. So when we look at how grackles performed on learning speed, we found that they were similar in their learning speed to California scrub jays, Darwin's finches, and pigeons, and that they were actually faster in their initial learning speed compared to pinion jays, Clark's nutcrackers, and then another study on California scrub jays. When it comes to behavioral flexibility or the number of trials to reverse their preference, we found that great tailed grackles are now similar to Darwin's finches and they're faster than all the other species. So this is actually really cool and interesting because as some of you might know, pinion jays, nutcrackers, and California scrub jays are all part of the corvid family, which also includes crows and ravens. And this is one of the notoriously smart families of birds. So people think they're the smartest birds in the bird kingdom. And here we show that great tailed grackles are doing better than they are at uh, behavioral flexibility and specifically the reversal learning task. So we found that yes, grackles are able to change their behavior when circumstances changed based on learning from previous experience and they're faster than these other species. And now we wanna know how does variation in behavioral flexibility relate to different cognitive traits, personality traits and physiology? And how does variation in behavioral flexibility relate to the proximity of that population to the range edge? Okay, so we measure different kinds of individual traits. So we measure several different um, cognitive traits and a few different personality traits. And I will talk about those here in a minute. But first I wanted to mention um, the physiological traits that we measure. So I told you that we take blood samples and we're actually able to get a lot of information out of a very small sample of each grackle's blood. And so with this blood, we have some very excellent collaborators, both within the US and internationally that help us to understand the uh, quality of the immune system in each individual, the hormone levels, their genetics, like genetic relatedness and uh, dispersal distance. And we're also able to look at what parasites they might have in the blood. Now, I'm not gonna talk about these for the rest of the talk and we don't have a ton of uh, the results back for these, but feel free to ask me questions if, about them if you want and I'll try to answer. So we measure all of these traits and then we compare the variation in these traits in grackles that are from populations at different locations along the range. And this is how we're able to ask address whether behavioral flexibility or some other traits might facilitate the range expansion and invasion of new habitats. So as I briefly mentioned, Karina started the Grackle project while she was in Santa Barbara, California between 2012 and 2015. And she was sort of testing out methods to address these questions. And then the Grackle project officially started in Arizona, um, in Tempe, Arizona in uh, between 2017 and 2020. So we actually pretty much just moved from Arizona to California um, in July. So we're really new here in California, still trying to figure things out. And that means that we don't have a ton of data to show you from the California population. And you'll mostly be seeing data from the Arizona population. So we expect to be collecting data in California on the grackles here on the range edge for about a year. And then depending on the situation in the world and coronavirus, the Grackle Project aims to move to Panama to study the Grackle population in the original center of the range. And so we'll be able to tell how populations vary in these traits. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you now about the different uh, cognitive and personality traits that we measure while the birds are in the aviaries. And you've already learned about how we measure behavioral flexibility with our reversal learning uh, color two test. And we additionally wanted to see how birds performed on a reversal learning test on a touchscreen apparatus. And this is because um, 
Measuring behavior and cognition and personality on touch screens is increasing in popularity because touch screens are really easy to program a bunch of tests into the one platform. Okay, so you just you don't have to have a bunch of different apparatuses and puzzle boxes and all that stuff. All you need is the touch screen, maybe it's an iPad, and you can take that more easily out into the wild and interact with um, wild birds or wild mammals or something with just one apparatus and get a bunch of different data. So we wanted to know whether touch screens would be feasible to use with grackles in the wild. And to do that, we wanted to make sure that the performance that they that we were getting on the touch screens was gonna be the same as this um, more established paradigm for measuring behavioral flexibility. So we taught the grackles to use a touch screen. In other words, they can tap on the screen and they'll get food. And for the reversal learning test, we used shapes instead of colors, but otherwise it's pretty similar. So each grackle has a shape and if they, that's rewarded for them, maybe it's the Pentagon. And if they tap on the Pentagon, then they'll get food. But if they tap on the diamond, they don't get any food. Um, and otherwise everything's the same. Once they've learned the association with the shape and the food, then we switch which shape is now going to be rewarded. Okay, so here is an example of what that looks like. Here is our touch screen setup. So this, this setup was not particularly amenable to carrying around into the field and stuff, but in the future, we would have been able to transition it to something like an iPad. So here we had this monitor that was a touch screen. It's controlled by a laptop. And then if the bird chooses the correct shape, then this component back here moves into place such that food is available if the grackle reaches their face into this compartment. So here we're gonna see one of our female subjects, Tapa, and she is rewarded if she touches the diamond. So she comes down and she definitely gets the diamond and so she gets the food reward. The next trial starts. But this time Tapa is gonna choose the Pentagon, which is not rewarded. So she doesn't get food and then she gets a longer inner trial interval, which is supposed to sort of punish her so that she learns more quickly. The next trial starts and let's see what she does. She's gonna get the diamond, so she gets the rewarded one again. Now, if you'll notice, she's always choosing the right side, the shape on the right side. So this could mean that instead of learning the shape, she's actually learning the location and we don't want that. So here she did go to the left to choose the diamond so we know that she's not just learning the side. So I want you guys to remember the slide I showed you with the results, the preliminary results from our reversal learning tubes experiment, where to the number of trials that it took for a bird to reverse its preference or the measure of behavioral flexibility ranged from I think 70 to maybe 130 trials. And here on the touch screen task that should be pretty identical, should lead to identical performance. Um, this is probably Tapa's 500th trial, maybe 550th. So it took way, way longer for birds to perform on both components of the reversal learning task on the touch screen compared to the tubes where both to make the initial discrimination where they learn the shape is associated with food. And then in the reversal part where they have to switch their preference, the trials were several orders of magnitude larger, the number of trials that it took for them to complete that portion. So Tapa took 450 trials to learn the initial discrimination. And then we actually stopped <laughs> working with her on the reversal learning because she was taking too long and we had to let her go. Um, but she was at, I think, um, 630 trials for her reversal, the reversal portion of this task. So we decided not to continue with the touchscreen reversal experiment. It did not seem to be measuring the same thing as the reversal learning tubes. Although we don't know for sure, this is potentially because touchscreens are not super ecologically relevant for grackles. There's nothing in their environment that resembles a touch screen in any way. And so it's possible that the sensory mechanisms that help them to learn are just not present with the touch screen. And so they're not able to make the associations as quickly. 
lots of fun speculation about that, but I don't have all the answers. Okay, so the next um, cognitive test that I wanna tell you about, uh, we use two different kinds of puzzle boxes. So the first puzzle box is a plastic square puzzle box that has one food item sitting on a pedestal in the center. And then there's four different options for accessing a food item. And three of them right here are options that are directly touching the food. So the goal is to manipulate one of the options in a way that knocks the food off the pedestal so it slides out the bottom of the box and the grackle can eat it. The other puzzle box is a little bit more natural looking, but it also has four compartments with doors that open in different ways to get to the food. So here as well, there are four options for four different options for accessing a food item. And what we want to know is how quickly are these birds able to figure out each of these different options, and that's a measure of problem solving. So they're learning the different ways that each of these options work, and then they're gonna demonstrate that they have learned this by exclusively going to that option and solving it uh, with only functional behaviors every time, every trial. Now, once they have done that, we make that option non-functional. And by that, I mean, we leave the compartment empty and the door open, like you see here, or we will leave the um, option on the plastic puzzle box. It'll be in there, but it won't be touching the food, or we'll tape the window closed so that the birds can't use it to get to the food anymore. So now, if you remember our definition of behavioral flexibility, the circumstance has changed. They were used to getting food with this one option, but now that's changed. They can't do it anymore. And we measure how long it takes them to change their behavior in response. So we can also use these puzzle boxes to measure behavioral flexibility. And this is nice because we can get an idea of whether both of these measures of behavioral flexibility, the puzzle boxes and the reversal learning tubes are getting at the same inherent trait. And that's really gonna be important for making sure that we are measuring what we think we're measuring. Okay, so here is another video, and this is a Dobo again. We saw him with the reversal learning tube. So let's see how he does with the plastic puzzle box. So he has not learned any of the options yet. So all of the options are functional. And we wanna see if he can come down and go directly to one of the options and manipulate it to get the food without making any extra pecks or non-functional behaviors. Okay, so there he goes and he pecks on the side of the box without actually really succeeding before subsequently using what we call the shovel option to get the food out. So although he is in the process of learning, we can't say yet that Adobo has officially learned how to solve the shovel option. Once he does go directly to the shovel and manipulate it so that it only causes the food to fall out, then we will make this option non-functional and it will essentially look like it does now where it's still in the box, but it's not touching the pedestal where the food is. So he can manipulate it all he wants then and he's not gonna be able to get the food. And we'll measure how long it takes for him to go to one of the other options as our measure of behavioral flexibility. We did some other tests of different cognitive abilities that I'm not gonna show you videos of or talk too much about, but again, you can feel free to ask me about these um, in the chat. So we measured inhibition in two different ways. And the first is this uh, clear tube. And this method has actually been used in a bunch of different animal species. So we wanted to test the grackles and see how they compare. And then we did another touch screen test called Go No Go, where they would see two shapes again, but instead of simultaneously, the shapes appear sequentially. And again, one shape is rewarded where the other is not. And we want to know if they're able to inhibit pecking the screen when the unrewarded shape is there. Um, and in contrast, peck the screen only for the rewarded shape. And so this is a measure of inhibition. And this touch screen test was actually more successful than the reversal one. But I do want to tell you about and show you some videos of the two um, personality traits that we measured while the birds were in the aviaries. So we chose to measure the personality traits exploration and boldness. And 
Um, we measured them in, in a few different ways, but I'm just going to show you an example of one each, basically. So we define exploration as the response to novelty to gather information that doesn't satisfy immediate needs. So to measure this, we have a novel environment, which here we're using this uh, mesh tent, which is actually made for cats. So if you need or want to take your cat outside in a way that's extra safe for birds, then you can buy this tent on Amazon, I think, and have your cat enjoy some outdoor time safely. And because we want to make sure that if grackles go to investigate the tent, they're doing this uh, for no other reason than just because or curiosity and ultimately we're hoping it's the, the trait exploration, we make sure that they always have access to their food and water while this is occurring. Okay, so here I'm gonna show you a video of one of our subjects, his name was Mole. And although you can't really tell from the video, his food dish is up here at the front and he has a water dish back here. Um, so he could come down and not go anywhere near this novel thing um, to get to his food or water. And we wanna know whether he will choose to go to the tent. I also wanted you to know that we make extra sure that the behavior of the experimenters is not affecting the grackles behavior in any way. So there are no experimenters in view while the exploration or boldness tests are going on. Okay, so let's see what Mole does. He goes to his water. Maybe he won't approach the tent. But no, he actually decides that he wants to get on the tent. So Mole is a fun, quirky bird. And during the 45 minutes of this exploration trial, oh, so here he's actually distracted by his neighbor on the other side of that partition. Sometimes he can see the shadow, but then he goes back to the tent. So Mole spent most of the 45 minute trial just interacting with all different parts of this tent. At one point, he even pulls some leaves and like a small branch off of his plant and he just like drags it all over the tent for some reason. So definitely some interesting behaviors going on here and they're not related to um, the need for food or water. In comparison, many of the other subjects that we did this test on didn't come to the ground at all, or they would come to the ground and only go to the food dish pretty much as far away from the tent as they could get while still getting the resources that they needed. So Molly might be a little bit of an outlier and we won't actually know this um, for another few months because we're actually still in the process of coding these videos. So I don't have results to show you, but just based on what I observed on the videos, the variation between um, birds like mole who go to the tent and birds that don't, it does seem like we're seeing consistent individual differences in behavior, which is the definition for personality. So it looks like we're seeing that grackles have the personality trait exploration, but again, we need to analyze the data before we can say for sure. Okay, so the other personality trait that I mentioned that we measure is boldness, which is defined as the propensity to take risks. And this is um, both novel risks, like this purple Halloween cat with these scary googly eyes, as well as familiar risks, like this Cooper's hawk. So a Cooper's hawk, for those of you that don't know, is a predator that focuses on eating birds, and they um, occur in all of the areas that the grackles do. Um, and in fact, I've seen in the wild Cooper's hawks chasing and trying to eat grackles. So this is definitely a known threat to the grackles. And we want to know how willing are grackles to get close to this threat in order to get something like food. We use a control condition that is a known non-threat. And so it's this stuffed pigeon. So pigeons um, were all over the place in Arizona in the same areas as the grackles and often they were competing for the same foods at our trap sites. Okay, so this is gonna be the, the hawk condition for our boldness test. And um, like I briefly mentioned, we wanna make sure that we actually are able to get data on how bold birds are. And because a threat is involved, um, a bird has no reason to approach the threat unless it's hungry. 
So in order to measure boldness, we food deprive the grackles for a certain amount of time before we give them this test. And then they don't have their food present, but we did put a cracker close to the threatening object. And so we can measure how willing they are to get close to it for food when they're hungry. Because threat is involved, these trials are much shorter than the exploration trials. So we are really wanting to see how willing birds are to um, approach a threatening object. And we need to make sure that they're hungry so that they have a motivation to do that. In this video, we're gonna see the same bird as in the explore, exploration video, um, Mole. And maybe you can guess based on how he performed in the exploration video, but he comes right down, lands on the head of our poor stuffed Cooper's hawk and even gives the hawk a few uh, a few pecks trying, it was not super clear whether he was being aggressive and trying to kill the bird or just trying to see what was going on. So he does go down and he kind of wanders around a little bit and eventually he will go to get the cracker. But again, Moe is kind of a standout here compared to the other birds that we did this test on where most of the birds stay on, on their perches up pretty much as high as they can get. And a lot of them were even doing alarm calling, which indicates that they are perceiving this stuffed Cooper's hawk as a threat, despite the fact that it's not moving. Um, and so again, we, we haven't analyzed the data, so this is anecdotal, but Molly performed the same um, very boldly and very uh, and with a lot of exploration on these two personality tests. And this can be an indication for what's called a behavioral syndrome, or in other words, it's two traits that evolve together. Um, so it's possible that we might see this in the grackles, but we have a lot more coding of videos to go before we can say that for sure. Okay, so now we've measured all these traits, both physiological, cognitive, and personality traits in the aviaries. And we wanna know how that relates or whether it relates to the natural behavior, behavior of individuals in the wild. And that's because it's this natural behavior in the wild that is actually going to influence whether they are able to expand their range, able to survive in novel uh, environments. And so we, to make sure that we can find these birds again and collect um, long-term data on them, we give them what are called uh, radio tags on little backpacks on their back. So this is a um, piece of equipment that emits a unique, very high frequency radio signal. Um, and it has an antenna, which I guess is kind of hard to see in this picture. And we're able to pick up that signal using this antenna and this specialized receiver. And by picking up the signal and narrowing down the strength of the signal with the receiver, we're able to pinpoint the grackle's location. Once we find the grackle, we do behavioral observations to measure their foraging behavior, their social behavior, and um, their space use behavior. So how they're actually moving about in their environment. What habitats are they preferring? How quickly are they moving from one place to the other? And with these data, we're really wanting to know are the individuals that were behaviorally flexible in the aviaries also the ones that are uh, eating more kinds of human food or have a greater variety of food that they're eating? Or maybe they're using a greater variety of actual foraging behaviors. Um, so we really wanna know if behavioral flexibility um, in, impacts the way that these individuals are interacting with their environment, maybe that's how the, they're able to expand their range so quickly. We also look at social behavior and um, I wanna show you, so I'm not gonna talk much about social behavior, but next I wanna show you what we're doing with the space use behavior. So these are two videos and the timing of the videos is the same, but they're two different individuals. And I, I, I know you guys think that maybe I didn't start the video on the left, but I actually did. And the bird is just barely moving or moving very small distances compared to the bird on the right. So this is an indication that in Arizona, the grackles that we were watching are potentially consistently different in the way that they move about their environment. 
And this could affect, um, this could be related to their behavioral flexibility and could affect how individuals are able to expand their range. So again, these are data that um, we collected in Arizona and we don't have yet in California. And so we can't compare whether the grackles in Arizona move differently than the ones in California. But there is evidence in other species that movement behavior uh, is related to the ability to invade into new habitat and expand the range, where individuals that are on the leading edge of an invasion front are moving more or dispersing further or moving faster. So pretty excited to look at these things with the grackles in California as soon as we're able to get up and running. Okay. So in conclusion, we wanted to know whether great-tailed grackles, which are a, rapidly, a, a species that is rapidly expanding their range, whether they were behaviorally flexible. And we found that yes, compared to other species on which the same methods have been used, great-tailed grackles are more behaviorally flexible. And then we wanted to know how behavioral flexibility was related to different uh, individual traits like several cognitive traits, two different personality traits, and some measures of uh, physiology. And we also wanted to know how variation in behavioral flexibility might relate to the proximity of the population to the range edge. And kind of as you guys already know, you're gonna have to stay tuned for that because we just have data from Arizona so far. We, we just got to California and we don't have any data on grad wolves here yet, but we are gonna start collecting data soon. So please make sure to check in and I can't wait to tell you what we find. I will say the one thing that we know um, comparing the two study sites, um, so something that was quite unexpected that we discovered in Arizona is that male great tape, some male great tailed grackles are actually being observed feeding fledglings. So in several blackbird species and until now in great tailed grackles, we thought that males provided no parental care. So they defended a territory, females built nests on that territory, and then females did all the care for the babies. They built the nest, they incubated, they feed the nestlings and feed the fledglings. But we discovered in Arizona that there was a relatively high frequency of males providing parental care once the babies left the nest, once they were fledglings. So this is what you're seeing down here. This is a male feeding a fledgling. This is actually one of our color banded males. We had two observations of color banded males feeding birds. And that means that we had blood samples and um, some behavioral data on them. And then this male up here, he's not at the nest because he was <laughs> his alarm calling at the photographer, but you can see that he has food in his mouth, which is not something that male grackles normally do unless they're feeding babies. So not all the males did this in Arizona, but we saw definitely more than a few doing it. And um, as soon as I arrived in California, I went to our, our future study site in Woodland um, this was during the breeding season and I saw males coming to nests with food in their beaks and, and uh, because the nesting habitat is more sparse, it's lower down, um, it was really easy to see the male actually sticking the food into the nestlings um, beak. So here it's cool because we're able to see the male actually coming to the nest, which we weren't able to really confirm in Arizona because of the way that the place that the birds nest. But again, it's male parental care in both places. So that's pretty exciting and something that you guys can stay tuned to hear more about because we're gonna be analyzing blood samples to try to understand um, which males choose to do male parental care and what other traits are related to it. Okay, so with that, I can take any questions that people might have, but I also wanted to point out that if you wanna learn more about grackles or keep tabs, on the project, please check out my supervisor's website. You can also check out my website. And I wanted to mention that the Grackle Project is unique in that we like all of our science to be open and accessible to anybody who wants to read it. So there's, there's no fee for getting access to it. It's not behind a, a paywall. And so you can check out our um, different investigations or experiments that are in progress 
the methods, the analyses, and the eventual results here at this GitHub webpage. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing, I suppose, for the question portion. Hello, Zane. Would you like to, to read some questions? Uh, sure, yeah, I can go for that. Um, well, let's see. Lucas would like to know how he could attract grackles to his yard um, and was asking about what kinds of trees he could look into planting or food and amenity, amenities that he could provide. He says that he's read that lizards um, can help and was wondering if that's true and also what kind of bird feeder might bring them in. Uh, yeah, I, that's a that's a good question. I'm not sure about lizards, but um, grackles love human food, <laughs> so um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I think in terms of feeders, you could probably just get a regular uh, platform feeder or one that's big enough that they can perch on and put any kind of food in it, really. And and um, I know that grackles in Arizona anyway were frequent feeder birds. Um, you could also put crackers. That's what we use in the aviaries to reward the grackles. We use goldfish crackers. And um, if you want a more natural food item, then mealworms are a good bet. Um, in terms of the plants, the grackles in Arizona nested in date palm trees. Um, and, but we also saw them in um, eucalyptus actually and so they nested in eucalyptus trees and we saw them in some like really dense I don't know like cypress looking trees so I think any type of tree that has some fairly dense foliage they will nest in um, but the females the material that they use to build the nest is kind of probably kind of like other um, blackbirds and marsh birds it's a it's like a very malleable grass type material so you might need a supply of that somewhere in your yard Interesting. Um, another question is, uh, he says, in my grackle research, I found that the Aztecs use grackle plumage for magic ceremony, um, and which has a lot to do with their proliferation. Do we know if this attention led to any sort of artificial evolution within the species? Um, in other words, did Aztec preference for the shiny iridescent grackle actually contribute to them becoming more shiny and iridescent? Were ancient grackles more lackluster? Yeah, um, great, great job on the research there. Um, so yeah, there's the records from way back then are spotty in terms of how the Aztecs might have affected the grackles. But in general, um, when humans are selectively taking the prettiest individuals from a species, that means that those individuals are dead and they're not able to reproduce, which means the genes that um, code for the pretty feature, like the iridescent feathers are being taken out of the population. So if anything, you would think if the Aztecs are taking the glossy iridescent um, standouts, then they would over time become less attractive. That makes sense. Um, how about is bill length indicative or reflective of overall nutrition during the formative months since hatching? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, my supervisor is going to be upset because I know that she looked at bill length in relation and skull length maybe in relation to some things, but I'm not remembering. So you could maybe check her website for that. But in general, one of the things that I noticed is that um, when we had the birds in the aviaries, we measured their bill when we first caught them, and then we measured it again when we went to release them. So potentially that was as long as six months in between. And some of their bills did actually grow. Um, specifically, the hook part of it would grow, and likely this is because they weren't getting the typical abrasive interactions that keep their bill a certain length. So it's possible that bill length is related to um, their environment and their foraging behavior. And in fact, in other bird species like the island scrub jay, um, there's variation in bill length um, and thickness that actually relates to the food they eat. So birds with certain bill types eat, uh, I think pinion, some kind of pine nut, 
and the other type eat acorns. And it also relates to the nature of their call. So there could be a lot of information there, but we're not really looking at all those things necessarily. All right. Um, have the parasites that have been found in grackles been found in other local birds? And is there a correlation between the introductions of grackles and the parasite? Okay, another good question that I don't really know the answer to. So it's hard to, especially in um, the data that we have so far in Arizona, where the grackles have been established there for a long time, the it's hard to, to tell the causal direction of these types of relationships. So we can't tell whether the parasites that grackles have um, and maybe other birds have, whether it's because grackles brought them into the population or whether it's because the grackles are in the same environment with these other birds where the parasites are present. Um, but, but in general, yes, they do share some, some parasite types, species. Okay. Um, how did the project determine which population to study in Panama, given that Central America is ground zero? Yeah, it's logistic feasibility. <laughs> so um, because the, the grackles are pretty common there, we wanted to make sure we could go in some place um, that is already set up for these types of tests. So someplace that has aviaries. Um, and so the idea is to use the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Um, it's meant for this, these kinds of studies and it will allow us to hit the ground running. Since we only have a year to collect data, we wanna make sure to get in and start collecting as much data as we can. So we won't have to, um, build the aviaries like we did here or in Arizona. That's cool. Um, someone says that they've read before that grackles have been observed teaming up to force squirrels into oncoming traffic and also to flip sparrows nests out of a tree. Um, these observations are remarkable because they show not just teamwork but also strategy. Are these observations believable? Do grackles actually strategize and collaborate against their opponents? I, that's so I think this is um, a good question because these types of op observations occur in all different kinds of species. And really what we're doing here is we're taking something that we observe and there we're applying our human feelings to it. And you just can't do that because we can't assume that birds have feelings at all or um, are able to um, plan unless unless you specifically test it. And so you would need to look at this in a, um, a balanced experiment where you have controls and then you have like a manipulated group. And then you might be able to tease out whether something like cooperation is occurring in those instances. So I would definitely take all of those kinds of instances with a grain of salt, unless it's um, a controlled experiment. Um, I think this was referring to Tapa, which was the one that got pulled from the experiment, but it says, um, so Tapa was that sharp, but wouldn't her continuation with the project contribute something to the results? Yes. So by that, I just meant that we had to stop that particular experiment. So she, um, I believe she was able to get through almost all of our other uh, cognitive and personality test in the aviaries. And then we followed her in the wild to collect her natural foraging and social behavior as well. So it was just that one particular test that she didn't complete. Okay. Um, how large do grackle plague populations tend to get? I've seen Walmart parking lots where the grackles black out the sky. Uh, what's the largest observed plague? Um, and is there a terminal population size or could they feasibly have a limitless population? Conversely, what's the smallest plague population that can feasibly survive? Can a great-tailed grackle survive alone in the wild? Um, so great-tailed grackles can survive alone in the wild, but they're not going to reproduce because there's no other grackles. So then that would be a population that would just like emerge and then die out in the lifespan of that grackle. In terms of the largest known, I'm not sure. I have seen those videos in parking lots where there's a couple thousand grackles and I don't think that's necessarily unusual. Um, this is a very social species, it's gregarious. So they really like to be in these large social groups. And um, while they're not always in large social groups, there are periods of their 
life or um, times of day where they're much more social than others. So grackles communally roost. So it, even though they might spend the day in groups of like maybe five um, around in their usual environment, at night they'll flock in like a couple hundred, maybe a thousand birds in one area, sometimes in one tree to sleep for the night. So I'm not really sure on the exact numbers, but um, I would say it's pretty common. There is probably never, <laughs> so except for outdoor cats, which are fed at home and then allowed to eat and kill things outside, there is never gonna be a natural population that ha can have limitless numbers because they're always gonna be limited by the food source. So when the grackle population reaches a certain limit, they're gonna eat up all the food and no more grackles are gonna be able to survive. Some of them are gonna starve. So there, there should be theoretically a plateau. All right. Um, how about, is there, is it known that grackles can pass learned observations down to like their offspring? No. Um, okay. That, uh, yeah, I'm, so to the things that they pass on to their offspring are their genes. Um, when they create the baby, they create the egg. And then if you think about it a little bit of a different way, they do sometimes pass, or they could, it hasn't been tested, they could pass certain things that they learn onto their children, their nestlings, the baby birds, um, if the babies are able to socially learn. So you would actually have to actually test that and it, you can test it. And it's been shown in several species of birds that young birds can learn things from their parents by observing their parents. But I'm not sure, I guess I wouldn't say that the parents passed it on to their offspring. Okay. Um, next up is most of the species expanding north with climate change are non-migratory. Is there literature to suggest that non-migratory species are potentially more flexible learners than migratory species who are perhaps hardwired and fixed in their ways? Yeah, that is a great question and very on topic. And I know that there's a paper that looks at this and I think, yeah, I'm not, I guess I can't say for sure, but I know that research has been done on this. And um, I think you're, you are right that the residents are more able to shift their range. And it kind of makes sense because uh, migratory birds are oftentimes imprinting on the appropriate breeding habitat when they're born and in the initial dispersal phases. And then that's all the information that they have because then they go south for the winter. And when they go to, to come north again, they're just focused on what was good habitat the previous year. So it makes sense that they wouldn't be as good at reacting to climate change. Um, but I can't say for sure that resident species that are more behaviorally flexible are better able to react to climate change specifically. Human land use change, um, it's possible, and I, that's what we're studying with the grackles, but we're not comparing it with additional species that may not be behaviorally flexible. Um, I was wondering, uh, that since great chilled grackles are obviously really smart and are using this to explode in their range, um, do you think that other grackle species or other blackbirds would perform similarly on these tests? Um, like corvids are known to be really, really smart as a group, but would you consider all blackbirds to be like a smart family or do you think that great tailed grackles are an exception? Um, so stay tuned because um, eventually Karina wants to test the boat tailed grackle, which is closely related and occurs in the, the Gulf Coast area in Florida. And this species has not really expanded its range. Um, so she is going to find out how they differ in these different traits that we're measuring. Um, oh, in terms of the other part of the question with other non-Blackbird species, um, I get asked this question a lot because I did my PhD research on jays, which are part, they're corvids. Um, and I really think that there are a lot of smart bird species and that people just, if they're interested in avian cognition or intelligence, they choose to study corvids because it's known that those species are smart. So I encourage people to um, do these kinds of 
tests of cognitive abilities on a wide array of bird species because I think that a lot of them would perform decently well and maybe comparably to corvids. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that way. Um, are grackles expand or are expanding grackles displacing any species? Yeah, another really good question. And nobody is really studying that as far as I know. So it's a very important question because this informs um, policy. This informs policy decisions by um, say like the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and those types of government organizations. So currently the great-tailed grackle is not considered invasive. And when it's considered invasive, by the federal government, that's when it's not protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act anymore. And so um, populations that become um, nuisance can actually be just kind of freely culled when it's an invasive species. And the grackles are not, they're still protected. So I think we do need more data on how grackles are affecting um, local populations of birds. And we can still get that because the grackles are still in this process of expanding their range. So you know, we need studies that look at how certain species were doing before the grackles arrived in their environment and how they do afterwards. Um, anecdotally, I can say that the when, when we were studying grackles in Arizona, we did see them sometimes kill other bird species or attempt to kill them. So we saw it kill a cactus wren and um, I saw them harassing like a, a baby woodpecker, but Un, uh, unclear what effect this has on those bird populations. Um, because the great tailed grackles nest in some of these ornamental or invasive tree species like the date palm, they're not really displacing the nesting location of other bird species that I know of. Um, so in that sense, they might not be affecting native bird communities. All right, um, and then last one, at least that's been posted so far. Uh, so my four-year-old wants to know if there's a way to make a grackle bird call so that he can talk with grackles in the grocery store parking lot. <laughs> that's that's adorable. <laughs> I'm glad that your four-year-old is interested in birds. I, I love that. Um, so grackles makes a lot of really weird noises and they sound, um, their, their song sounds really metallic to me. So it seems hard to, to do with your mouth. Um, they do make some chuck calls that you could maybe maybe imitate, but also there are uh, there's a free bird app called Merlin that you can download on your phone, and those those come with a bunch of different birds that are found in North America and their vocalizations. So you can open up the app and play the grackle song and see how the ones that are around you react. Um, they do caution uh, so this is advice from Cornell Lab of Ornithology, that if you do too many call playbacks for bird species in general with this, this type of app, it's harassment for these bird species and it can negatively affect their behavior. So use it judiciously. Um, thank you. That looks like that's it, unless anyone is still typing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Kelsey. Uh, for folks who are, you know, the grackle looks like a, a, a large Brewer's Blackbird. Uh, you mentioned the Merlin Bird app, the free app from Cornell Laboratories. Uh, would that be useful for someone who is trying to uh, identify a, a, a black colored bird that they see, uh, be it a crow, a, a Brewer's Blackbird or a grackle, especially the grackle and the Brewer's Blackbird, both with, with white eyes. Would Merlin be helpful for uh, to a person in trying to uh, make that determination? Yeah, I think those bird apps are really helpful. There is a bit of a learning curve with um, being able to narrow down your mm -hmm. what you're looking at in terms of possibilities. So um, definitely give it a try with the bird app. But also, I, I find the bird species that are black um, aside from the different crow species and ravens, to be relatively easy to tell apart, um, especially based on size. So Brewer's blackbirds are pretty small, and compared, and so the great-tailed grackle in comparison has a super long tail. Like the tail is probably longer than its body length, and it is a funny shape. So it looks like this. Um, that's it looks like this when when they have it at rest, and they can flare it out, and it becomes like. Uh, 
it's like curved. Um, it has it has a rounded edge. So um, there's that. So definitely look for the tail on the males. And then the white eye, in, in terms of telling them apart from crows, the white eye is a dead giveaway. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about females, um, the female great-tailed grackles are, I think, more uniformly brown. They don't have much like speckling on them like a um, red winged blackbird female would have. So they're pretty like cinnamon and they sometimes have an eye, like a lighter color brown eye line. And they, they also have the white eye if they're adults. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's good. That's good for folks to know because, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I know when I first got started, it was kind of hard to figure these things out, uh, come up with time. Excellent. Okay. Um, is it possible for you to show the uh, website addresses again? Yeah, certainly. Let Especially me... for the GitHub. Yeah, let me get to that. I'm gonna write it down this time. <laughs> share my screen here. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, folks, go. this is uh, an excellent way to to get more information and to uh, keep you know, um, abreast of what the project is doing, the progress they're making. Um, and you can also, on my website, there's a way, if you have additional questions, there's a way to email me or contact me through the website. Okay. Also, while uh, people are writing, uh, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording this and it will be available on our website. You'll, you can find out where to go on YouTube. We do have a YouTube channel now. So if you're not furiously writing, you can just uh, go on our website and track it down later and, and uh, share this talk with anyone who couldn't be here tonight. Now you tell me after I've written it down, my hand's all tired now. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, the uh, recording uh, will be available uh, in one or two days, and then um, and I'll work with our uh, <coughs> excuse me, our brain trust and get it up on the uh, YouTube channel. So, okay, uh, Zane, any other any other questions uh, come in? Nope, that looks like it. Okay, well, Kelsey, I I'll tell you, I was very uh, uh, interested uh, in hearing this and. And I was pleased trying to follow along with it. And I felt sorry for Tappa, but um, I think it's a, a, a great way to, um, to determine, uh, you know, why this species is moving with this personality uh, experiments you're doing and, and, and Mole and his boldness. Uh, <laughs> who knew? He jumps on top of the stuffed bird, picks it in the head. Yeah. It's, it's for real. So I am really pleased that you um, you decided that you would oh, do this for us tonight and make this presentation because I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope everyone else in, enjoyed it uh, and, and, and learned something about this bird we see uh, as we're driving about or doing our thing here in Yolo County and just, oh, where'd that bird come from? And <laughs> uh, what is that? And because and, uh, they are very distinctive once uh, you stop and, and you listen to them, you watch them fly, watch them interact with each other, especially like you say, their, their calls, their metallic calls. And it's like, it's just a mechanical racking. You look for a, a, yeah. a car wreck or something. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much uh, for making this presentation. And uh, we, what I would like to do uh, sometime later, maybe next year, uh, depending on where you are and things and where everybody is, is uh, hear about your, uh, your J story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. I had a really great time and I would love to come back to talk about that or hopefully maybe in a year from now to talk about how our data collection in California went with the grackle. Yeah, yeah, yeah that too. An update on that. So anyway, um, yeah, no more questions. And so just thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. And, mm -hmm. and thank you very much. And, you know, best wishes. Uh, during these times, but also just great fortune in your study. 
and uh, hope Mole continues to be a rock star. <laughs> and Tapa needs some confidence, so build I, her up. Aside from that, Tapa was actually one of my favorites. So okay, <laughs> don't, don't feel too bad for her. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, anything from our president? <laughs> no, I was just going to say we want to have Kelsey back in a year, and by then we may have some Yellow County personalities that we will. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Anne.